Okay, let's get started. Sketchbook, welcome. This is going to be our last part of this series going into um, Samuel chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Uh, and then uh, if there's some more free time afterwards, I want to talk about something I mentioned earlier in my in my uh, video that I did in the daytime pertaining to spiritual warfare and things like that. So definitely going to be talking about that subject and pulling the scriptures for it. But first I want to commit to um, completing this part, this, uh, this series that um, has been very beneficial to myself and to uh, I pray and hope for you guys as well. So, um, yeah, let's, let's just jump right into it, actually. I'm, I'm ready to go. All right, so, 1 Samuel, chapter 20, verse 1 through 4, okay? This is talking about the means of David and Jonathan. Hey, bud, what's going on, Brother Boyce, and what's going on, Sketchbook? Welcome, welcome, glad you could be here. All right, let's go, let's read through the scriptures. I'm reading from the ESV. I call it the infamous line of Judah version um, let's do this here we go then David fled from Naoth Naoth and Ramah Ramah and came and said before Jonathan what have I done what is my guilt what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life and he said to him far from it you shall not die behold my father does nothing either great or small without disclosing it to me. Why should my father hide this from me? It is not so. But David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan says to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Okay? Um, I want to I want to break this four verses down. Um, there's more to this chapter, and it's an amazing read. I mean, obviously, all the Bible is an amazing read, but just pertaining to this uh, this part where David and Jonathan are really um, having this moment of of security between one another. Um, I do advise you guys to read throughout the whole chapter, but we're focusing on just the first uh, four verses. Okay, um, so here we go. Let's pray, and then we'll break this down. Uh, Father God, Lord, I just thank you first and foremost again for this Bible study on this Monday night. Lord, I just praise you, glorify you, I worship you, I bless your name. Lord, I pray your spirit would minister your words right now. Holy Spirit, just take full control. Um, this vessel is yours. I don't want none of the glory, none of the platform, none of the followers. Nothing, Lord, if it's not for me. I want what you have for me. I want what you what's all the things that you have for this vessel, the good and bad, I want all of it, Father God. I want to be obedient to your will. And I know this is a part of it, me ministering your word, not by my knowledge, not by my intellect, not by my by whatever I, I an experience. None of that, none of that is, is even in an in a area or level close to your all-knowing intellect, your all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God. And I, I, I praise you, God. I praise you, God, that I can speak to you right now. I'm in awe of your power. I am fearful of you, Lord. I know what you're capable of as is shown in Scripture. I just thank you, Jesus, that we could take this time to study the importance of consistent kingdom friendship. Uh, Lord, I want to sharpen and, and encourage, do an exhortation today of your word for my brother, beloved brothers and sisters so they may be encouraged and do the same or that much more, Father. And I praise you and I say this in your precious and holy name, that of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Welcome, Raymond, Sister Kiara. Welcome, welcome. We are going over First Samuel, uh, chapter twenty. Ooh, I forgot to add the chapter in. Sorry. Let me just write it in the comments real quick. This is First Samuel twenty, uh, one through four, with the little iron sharpens iron. All right. Okay. And let's um let's read over Proverbs. This is what I, I love reading Proverbs twenty seven seventeen, pertaining to this stuff this series because it it really uh, allows us to, to to set the mood for the night, uh, pertaining to what we're really studying about, right? So Proverbs twenty seven verse seventeen, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens 
another or in 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 the in the ESV in the footnote uh, another stands for is Hebrew for sharpens the face of another right sharpens the countenance of another okay iron sharpens iron so does a man sharpens the countenance of another in other versions is a iron sharpens iron so does a man sharpen the countenance of his friend um, so on and so forth but you understand the the understanding of that verse you understand what it's implying the the practical means to it um, two blades sharpening one another iron striking iron sharpening each other right they're sharpening each other we're going to go into that deep tonight deep 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 proverbs 27 17 i'm going to break that down as well i want to also do uh first with david and jonathan and then we're going to wrap up this whole uh series with the study of proverbs 7 27 17 to really nail it home okay to put the nail the hammer on the nail so to speak okay so these first four ver verses uh david is fleeing from Saul because his he in the last chapter Saul is 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 delegating to his 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 counsel and to his son that he wants to uh, murder David right so David flees he gets out of there he he doesn't want to you know obviously he wants his life he doesn't want to die so he runs out of there and he's talking to Jonathan now and he's he's saying what 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 is it that I've done to your father that he seeks my life like he is he is he is honestly concerned and he's worried he's like i've not done anything wrong to your father if not i've done everything your father has of has asked of me um when i he act when i asked for his daughter's hand in marriage he said to go kill you know to, to bring back a certain specific objects from the philistines which he did the you know you know context and you know you know warning disclaimer he asked for the philistines foreskin he brought back 200 foreskins right back to Saul in order so he can marry his daughter. So he's done the request of Saul. He's fought in armies. He's brought victory to Israel. He has played music for Saul's spirit to be calmed. You know, David has been an absolute um, treasure to Saul. So he does not understand um, why he is being sought after so, um, so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sought after so desperately. By Saul, but like Saul wants to, he he's on this, this this bloodlust type of thinking. Like he he has to find David. He has to destroy him before you know he takes the throne, which is already given to him by God. It's nothing Saul can do about it. But um, David is just like, what what am I? What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And it's, and it's, can you imagine, like, David is welcomed into Saul's family. David did what God God was calling him to do. He, you know, he took out Goliath and even before that being a shepherd, right? He was doing the will of the Father. And can you imagine being in a place that the people is bringing you into the next season, you know, physically, because obviously God is the one that's bringing David into the new season. But physically in the natural realm, Saul was the one bringing David into his family. Saul was the one that was bringing David into into his actual inner circle, right? He is marrying his daughter. He's, leader of his army right he, he is close friends with his son jonathan saul was the one that brought david physically naturally obviously god was sovereign and was in control of that but saul was the one that brought david so david is thinking i love this this man is giving me honor he's showing me respect he's giving me royalty to a shepherd boy you know you can, you can kind of get a glimpse of david's attitude right you can kind of get a glimpse of his personality it just it just it just comes off the page he's like i have not done nothing to your father i i haven't done anything to 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 cause him to to to, to take my life i have said nothing what have i done what what sin have i caused your father to 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 come at me at this in this manner in this tone right he would think like an enemy of david would do that to david but no it was saul the someone that david uh, respected David saw him as his own father he loved Saul he cared for him he played music to calm his spirit right can you imagine being in that position right as David and and then and, and realizing that someone that you love desperately is the one that's out after you I mean I, I, I can only imagine how many of us has been in that position where you're pouring your life out and you're serving God and you're trying to help your loved ones and you're trying to be there for your family and trying to be there for your friends and then the immediate response is 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 a distaste to what you're doing is a there's a there's an animosity towards you there's a there's an envious or a jealousy towards you and you're not understanding what is the meaning behind it you're not doing nothing wrong to them right so what 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 is stirring up Saul's spirit and we have to understand what's happening in Saul Saul 
was anointed by God to be king of Israel. He was the first king of Israel. He lost his anointing of God when he he flippantly disobeyed God's order through Samuel the prophet. He flippantly uh, uh, disobeyed twice. And Samuel, and God just, just was flat out like, nah, you, you messed up, you, you, you lost your chance, you did what I told you not to do. Can you imagine if that was the case with us? Can you imagine if you messed up your second time in your walk and God was like, nope, you can't, you, there's, just, there's no way I can fill you with my spirit no more. That's, that's it. I got to take this out of you because you, you, you done wrong by me. You disrespected me. You, you did not hear my words. You did not heed my instruction, right? Can you imagine like... Like, I read this scripture, right? And I'm going over it in my head. And I'm like, how many times have I messed up? I imagine I was in Saul's position. I would have lost a long time. I would have lost the anointing a long time ago if that was the case, right? If, if, if I keep making mistakes. But this is how God was uh, prioritizing his, his, his people on the earth. Because remember, the first covenant with Israel was about physical territory. It was about physical land. They had to physically take the land of Jerusalem. They had to physically take the land for the children of Israel, right? It was a physical, uh, um, um, a physical war that they were waging against uh, those that are against the Israelites, right? So, so that that just showing that God's how serious God took His people, how serious He took His commandments, how serious He took obedience, how serious He took uh, um, um, His children when they were disobedient, right? So David, on the other hand, not saying he's perfect, not, obviously not, as we can obviously just see down the line how imperfect David is. But you see that the, the, the David at this current moment, he, he is just honestly living for the Lord, right? He's honestly living for the Lord. He's giving, he's doing his, 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 his means, he's praying. He, he ha he's created a great fellowship with Jonathan, right? So he's asking Jonathan, his best friend. Why is it that your father seeks me? And, and, the, and the obvious answer to that is that his father is filled. And this is actually very really beautiful because it's going to play into what I'm talking about uh, later on this stream. But let's not let's not lose our way. Saul is filled with the spirit. It says that God gave him an evil spirit. He let an evil spirit be upon Saul. That's crazy. Can you imagine you you lose your anointing from God? Then God fills you with an evil spirit. He, he, he It says in the scripture, don't miss it. This is why you have to be careful when you say God is love and God is mercy and grace and God is this and God is that. Okay, but God also is God of righteousness and judgment and chastisement. He was chastising Saul. He let an evil spirit consume his mind to the point where he wanted to kill his one and his his someone that loved him, that cherished him. Okay, don't miss spiritual warfare in OT. Don't miss spiritual warfare in Old Testament. This stuff is crucial. So Saul is filled with the evil spirit. He wants to take down uh, uh, an anointed child of God, right? He wants he wants to get rid of David. David doesn't understand why Saul is, is so persistent after his life. And then and then look, and this is the beautiful context of what we're talking about. This is the beautiful context of a spiritually consistent kingdom-based friendship, right? Jonathan absolutely loves David. He wants no harm to come upon him and he's trying to explain his father imagine that like i know i kept seeing that saying that but it's like this the word just just pops out at me not only is david confused imagine being in david's position being confused about what, what's going on imagine being in saul's position being conflicted with an evil spirit in your vessel right and and i will talk about that later don't worry i'm not going to lose that thought being conflicted with an evil spirit wanting to take out david and then on jonathan's behalf trying to explain his father what his father is doing what his father is what why why does his father even think like that look it says uh and he's jonathan said to david far from it you shall not die you shall not die right um uh, behold my father does nothing either great or small without disclosing it to me he's like listen in my understanding of what i've understand my father as a king he's always disclosed his words his, his next plan of attack, his next plan of, of movement in Israel, right, with me and the council, with me and his servants, right? He always discloses this information. So why would he hide this from me? Right? Now, he's telling him, like, oh, you're not going to die. No, I, I, or anything my father does, he always, he always runs it my way. And then you see Jonathan kind of questioning it a little bit. He's like, well... Why wouldn't he close it with me, right? Well, I mean, I'm his son. 
Like, imagine that. That's that's another conversation. Imagine you're a son of a king, and you just get this thought in your head like, Dad does not have your best interest in mind, Jonathan. Your dad does not have your best interest in mind. He doesn't have David's best interest in mind. What Saul's best interest is, is himself. Okay? Saul's best interest is for himself, and he's manipulating his son to make it seem like, Oh, David is the problem. You're supposed to be next in line to be the king, not David. So, Jonathan, you need to we need to get this situation resolved because you're supposed to be next in line to be a king. But Saul's not really looking out for his son. Like if you if you see here, he 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 just told Jonathan that he's not gonna kill David. He says, "I swore," as we talked about in the last part, last uh, last uh, part of this uh, uh, series, last last Sunday or last Monday. I'm sorry. Um, Saul says, "I I I as the Lord lives." You sh he should not be put to death, right? He tells that to his son. David's not going to get killed, all right? But, but as the Lord lives, I will not put David to death. And then he changes his mind. He, he, he does a 180, and he says, no, I have to take out David. I have to take him out. So Jonathan is confused. David is confused. Saul is on the move. He's ready to find David. So David is explaining to him, like, listen, Jonathan, your dad, your father knows about our, our, our friendship. He knows about our relationship as, as, as we consider each other brothers. He understands that you and I are, 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 we have, you have found favor in me and I have found favor in you, right? So David is like, your dad knows this. It's not, a, it's not, it's not something that, um, um, it's not something that's not understood. Like everybody is aware that Jonathan, oh, well, I'm in this context, Saul is very much aware that Jonathan and David are close friends, very close friends. And, um, and, he, and he's saying, like, basically, your dad's not going to tell you because he doesn't want to grieve your heart. He doesn't want to let you know that I'm going to go take out David because he grieves your heart. So, so it's, it's, it's a weird, if you read this for what it is, it's a weird conversation. David is confused that Jonathan, he's, David's confused why Saul's after him. Jonathan's trying to explain to David that, that, that his father always discloses this information upon him. And then Jonathan has a turn of events and he says, well, why wouldn't he? share that information with me and then david now is understanding the situation and he's like well it's because your dad knows that you and i have found favor in each other and he's not going to disclose that information for you because he doesn't want to grieve your heart so it's weird if you read this like <laughs> if, without any context you're just reading this as is you'll be very confused because it looks like they're just kind of going back and forth on a teeter-totter like david's like i don't know what's going on then david knows what's going on then jonathan doesn't know what's going on then now Jonathan knows what's going on. They're like this back and forth happening, right? It's a very confusing situation between the two because David's life is on the line. He is literally on the run. He's like, where am I supposed to go? I, I, I was just a shepherd's boy living with my father, Jesse. And now I'm living in the king of in the kingdom's in the king's house of in, in Jerusalem, and now I'm on the run from the king. Like what in like a timeline? Like what what's going on? David is lost. Jonathan is trying to calm his friend. He's like, listen, man, I'm here for you. Don't worry, my dad's not gonna kill you. He's not gonna do nothing these things to harm you, right? It, it's it's a weird back and forth. But he but David says something that's very interesting. He says, but truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, speaking to Jonathan. Right, as your soul lives, um, hold on. There is but a step between me and death. And what does Jonathan say? Then Jonathan says to David, "Whatever you say, I will do for you." Okay, we're gonna park here for the whole <laughs> rest of the, the the study here. So David is saying, "Listen, I am just one step, one step between me and death. As you as you know, as your soul lives, as you live." Right, as my as I live, I am one step away. He he acknowledges the situation. He acknowledges the how dire it is. He knows his life is on the line. And imagine this is a man of war. This guy has been in battles against the Philistines. He has led armies to victory. Right. He has brought Israel victory after victory after victory. This is David. David is in his prime, and he's not even king yet. Right. He's just in this weird, awkward. A stage where he's like trying to live for the Lord, but it's just like the one that he thinks is serving the Lord with him, not Jonathan. Obviously, Jonathan is serving God, but the one that he thinks is 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 he is really running the show and you know trying to make things work for Israel is Saul. He's like Saul. We do these things for the Lord. You know, you, God has appointed you to do these things. God has appointed you to lead this 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 uh, your, his children, right? The, the the children of Israel, and David is like doing all these things, and then now to be in this position where now he's on the run. Now his life is on the line. Remember, this guy was a confident, successful, war 
tactician. David was he knew how to fight. He got experience after date after fighting Goliath. It was like this confidence, this bolstered into his spirit, this boldness. Man, this is perfect. This is gonna beautifully set up um Proverbs 27, 17, and also a little bit about spiritual warfare at the end of this. Um, but David is a full-on flesh, he's a fleshed out bona fide warrior. This man has swords in his hands and he goes to battle. And he's worried, he's worried about his own life. Like, it clicked in his head, like, man, my battle is, a, is not against Saul, but my battle is to make sure that I don't get killed from Saul's hand. Like, David is legit trying to live. He, he doesn't want to die. He, 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 he acknowledges his life. He says, I'm just a step. It's one step between me and death. He he acknowledges the severity of his situation to Jonathan. He's he this is this is this is the beautiful thing about their fr friendship, okay? David is on the verge of a possible assassination, right? He's on the verge of a possible like someone's kind of coming out to get him. Saul's sending out his army, his legion to take out David, right? David is disclosing this information because he loves Jonathan so much and he trusts Jonathan so much. He's disclosing this information with the son of the king that wants to kill David. I have to repeat that again. Watch this. David trusts Jonathan so much and loves Jonathan so much that he's disclosing this information to the son of the king who wants to destroy David. Okay? That is the... That is the, the the full context of their relationship. That they are so, um, they're on, on they're on that level of intentional fellowship. That David, in the midst of that one step, that that next moment, like it's here and now, he's hitting the ground running. He hit the ground running. He's legit trying to run away from Saul, right? Trying to figure the situation out. He discloses this all this information to Jonathan. If and now, if I put this into a modern spin, right, into a nowadays context, it's like you disclosing information to someone that you love, that's your bro or your you know sister, sister, whatever. You disclose this information with them, right? And they know the person, or they're related to the person that hates you. Now, if this was a modern day situation and we were not following the spirit and this walk was all about the flesh and you were not doing what God wants, you would your first reaction is, I ain't telling you nothing. The last thing I want to do is tell you, you know the person. You're actually related to that person. Why in the world would I tell you vital information about my life that's going to cause that person to come and use that against me? If we're all being honest, right? If we're all being, if we're all being in, in, a, in a very honest walk that's not easy it's not easy when you have something that you don't want to share that's very crucial maybe life-threatening and you're telling it to your brother that you love or a sister to sister that you love and they're related to the person that is out to get you in some way shape or fashion that's going to cause ruin to you would you trust your brother or your sister now that's discernment that that's discernment that's trust that's that's you saying I'm willing to open myself up. That means you're vulnerable. Like do you you catching this? This is four four verses from here to here, four verses. And how much are we getting out of this small little set of verses? It is is this is God's word, guys. This is God's word. This is what happens when we read God's word for what it is. It is a powerful 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 move of the spirit. This word is alive. The word is living, right? And, and we're grabbing that from four verses. That's just, it just blows my mind. We're grabbing this from four verses, okay? David not only has good discernment, he has trust in Jonathan, he has fellowship with Jonathan. This is the grounds of consistent kingship, kingdom friendship. Jonathan and David trust each other with their lives, okay? Jonathan's life is, is on trial too because he keeps talking to his father's enemy. I mean, obviously, you know, David is not an enemy, but in his father's eyes, in the spirit that dwells within Saul, right? That spirit that's that's plaguing him, causing him to be angry and frustrated and leading right into a beautiful talk about discernment and deliverance, right? Saul has this spirit inside of him that's just invoking this, this bloodlust to take out David, right? And isn't that crazy? Like Jonathan's life is on the line, if you think about it, because you're, you're violating a king's order, right? If you want to be 
you know, if you want to be s s true to the word, if you want to be true to the context of the situation, Jonathan was in, is, is in a very dangerous position because he keeps giving vital information to the enemy, to his father's enemy, David. David is the enemy of the father right now, of his father. But Jonathan also has good discernment and trust in David, and he also trusts in God. They have a, they have a trust with the father because they know, I must do the work of my father. I must do what Yahweh says. I must do what the Lord says. David is not an enemy. He has not sinned them against my father. There is no witness of this. And I will not bear false witness just because it's my father. You see that? I will not bear false witness just because that's my blood. I will not bear witness just because that's my brother. Blood by blood. Or my sister by blood. Or my parents by blood. You see, this, 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 these set of verses are dangerous because what it's showing me it's showing me that yes, you must have you have parents, and yes, you may honor them. Jonathan's honoring his father, right? Yes, you must honor your parents, honor your mother and your father, as it says in Ephesians six, chapter six, as a commandment, right, of God. But we must draw the line. You have to draw the line. You have to draw the line for it becomes honoring your father and mother, or are you going to be honoring your father and mother more when it comes into something that's an evil context, or are you going to honor your heavenly father and an eternal grand scheme context jonathan chose the latter he says i'm i'm gonna follow yahweh's order i know david didn't sin against my father i jonathan is is fully uh aware of that david is fully aware of that i have not sinned and and, and honestly honestly david if he did sin against it all i think he would have told jonathan like hey man yeah you know i did do something wrong to your dad maybe you weren't there you know, I, I feel like they had such a great relationship with one another that if David were an enemy to his father, I think he would flat out tell Jonathan, like, listen, man, I know it's going to grieve your heart, but I, I actually am doing something wrong against the king, right? Or I'm actually trying to take his kingdom from him, right? No, David is just being honest. He's like, listen, dude, I am not doing nothing wrong against your dad. I love your father. That's crazy. It, it, that's that's David's heart for, for Saul. He loves Saul. He plays the harp. He plays the music. To soothe the spirit of Saul, to soothe that anger in the, in his father, that spirit that dwells within Saul through David's music, he is he is it, it's like he is he is um he is what's the word sedating, sedating like he's he's causing the spirit to become asleep, right? He's causing the David to, he, David is calling the spirit to fall asleep through his through the gift that God has given him to play music, right? So 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 David is like trying to figure out the situation. Jonathan's trying to figure out the situation. They both know what's going on, right? So how does this play, uh, apply to the context of iron sharpens iron? Okay. Now, from this point forward, after verse 4, we're not going to go into it, but basically what happens next is that David and Jonathan come up with a plan to, to figure out how David should approach his next steps, right? And long story short, Jonathan says something to David along the lines like, listen, I'm going to have you sit out in a spot. And my father's going to release some information to me. If it's good for you to stay, I'm going I'm to shoot an arrow and then I'm going to say something to my, my servant to grab the arrow or whatever. And if, if my father says he's coming after you, I'm going to shoot my, far, my arrow far off and tell you, um, servant, you must go grab the arrow. It's behind the rock. You know, some, some, a situation that happens where David is, 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 is given a plan by Jonathan to execute what's his next steps. And ultimately what happens is Jonathan's like, oh, yeah, no, my, my dad's coming after you. My dad's trying to kill you. You need to get out of here ASAP. Basically, right between the context between them two. So so they're forming this idea. So then the, the, the beauty of this friendship that David and Jonathan have is that they are, they are still friends. They're, st they're still bros. They're still iron sharpens iron happening here. They're not this. They're not. They're not. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not causing each other to stumble. David is not telling Jonathan, oh, oh, you know what? Come with me or hey, hey, Jonathan. Hey, just forget about your father. Just come go. Let's go hide out together. And nor is Jonathan telling David that they are working together for what? For their for the sake of each other. Okay, there you don't see a sake, you don't see a, a situation where it pertains to selfishness between the two. That's real friendship. A real friend is selfless to you. A real a friend that you cherish is selfless to you. They're not gonna put themselves first before you. Okay. Do you see the beauty of 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 having the, and, and and the crazy thing is, a lot of us have friends like that that are selfless to us. Yeah, we treat them. Like, we're, we treat them with us being selfish. We, we abuse that. 
of them, right? We need to be like David and Jonathan, that they're both equally selfless to one another. And that is the also the beautiful relationship between a brother in Christ and another brother in Christ and a sister in Christ between another sister in Christ. It is this constant vulnerability, right? Self Being selfless is vulnerability because you're basically extending yourself to another person that's not you. And if we're in a worldly mindset, right? If we're not being led by the spirit, if we do things that are of our own flesh and our own logic, the last thing I'm going to do is let myself be opened up. The last thing I'm going to do is is allow myself to, to get attacked or be vulnerable or to give you an advantage over me. That's a flesh mindset. That's a worldly Christian mindset. I ain't giving you no power. I ain't giving you no nothing from me. You're not going to hear no secrets. You're not going to get no trust out of me. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to use everything you have for me. Take full advantage of the situation, right? And that's not That's not right. That's not biblical. That's not what God's called us to be. We are supposed to be opposite of the world. We're supposed to be a light and salt of the world. We're supposed to live in the world, but we're not of the world, okay? And God is showing us in the scripture and what he's revealing to me through the series is we need to be selfless to those that God has entrusted in us to be brothers and sister in arms. I'm talking about brothers and sisters that you could stand next to, pray with, fast with, read the word with. They're going to encourage you. You encourage them. And also, also a real brother and sister is going to is going to rebuke you when you mess up, rebuke you when you get in lazy, rebuke you when you slacken, rebuke you when you get transparent. I'm sorry, when you get um, 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 passive, rebuke you and chastise you and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, what's going on? You're supposed to be walking with the Lord. You're supposed to be following God's law. What's going on? I need to get you back on right footing. A real friend, a real friend is going to provide that tough love when it's needed. A real friend is going to be there uh, for you when you're down in now a real friend is not going to let you slip slip a real friend is not going to let you fall to the cracks a real friend is not going to let you get lazy in your walk a real friend is not going to just say oh you know maybe we can just read the word once a blue and oh you know let's go to church every once in a while and oh you know and oh we're going to act like the enemy has no taxing and he's not going to attack us and you know we're not going to have any spiritual warfare none of that no 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 here it shows me that in the midst of extreme circumstances david is going through extreme circumstances his life is on he is one step from life between life and death and in the midst of extreme circumstances you will know who's your friend you will know who's your brother brother you will know who's your sister sister you will know who is the ride or die brother or sister you will know who's that christian that loves you to the point where they're like listen i am here to help you in this most critical moment of your life and i'm not gonna leave you do you know how many times I bet anyone could vouch for this. When you have people in your life that you thought were going to be there for you when you needed them, and they freaking, they, I'm sorry, not freaking, they peaced out on you. They left you. Left you in a critical moment. They left you in moments of uncertainty. They left you to figure it out on your own. Is that a real friend? No. A real friend, a real brother, a real sister, a real Jonathan, a real David will be there for you in the midst, in the midst of the valley. In the midst of the mountaintop, praising God with you and also lamenting with you before God. Praying with you before God and lamenting before God. Joyful before the Lord and, and sorrowful before the Lord. There's there you have you gotta find that brother or sister, and I promise you, God is the type of God that He's so good, He's gonna put that one, He's gonna either it's a few or many. But God is always gonna have that one person in your life that you must cherish brother and sister that one person in your life that you must cherish do not lose that relationship do not use that valuable relationship with that person and you will know who it is like i can i can i can like i said in the last um parts of this of this video i know who my iron sharp and iron guys are i know who my proverbs 27 17 brothers are like i i know who's a jonathan in my life i know who's a david in my life i god has god has blessed me with not just one but multiple brothers that i can count on in the midst of me failing and also, I pray that I am the same for them, okay? I, and I thank God, and I know this is the case, because God makes us understand that this walk is not meant to walk alone. David is on the verge of death, guys. And Jonathan was the one that God sent in David's life to be there in time of need. Who am I speaking to tonight? God has always, 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 never once in your life has God just 
left you to die alone in the in the midst of the valley he always has a brother or sister if you've been walking in this life for some time he always has a brother and sister there maybe not there physically but praying for you fasting for you meditating on the word for you pro speaking prophetic tongues over you like just being there for you as a person in battle in combat they are not letting you gonna sit there and rot if an arrow flies your way a brother and sister is not gonna let you sit and rot when you get a, a someone a, you know, when a, a demon or spirit comes and stabs you in the back Right, in the form of betrayal, in the form of deception, in the form of critical trials and temptations, right? A real brother is going to pick you up, put you on your back. Uh, right, he's going to put you on your on his back, and they're going to gonna get you across that spiritual battlefield. And then the same for you to them. When they're down, when they're out, don't let them just give you all the goods. you got to extend that back, right back. This is the beautiful... A, a cycle of good friendship is you constantly extend yourself to the other person so there's never a sense of oh I'm giving more in our friendship uh, I'm giving more in our relationship and you're not giving me nothing right that, that's why we can't have a worldly mindset when it comes to marriage we can't have a worldly mindset when it comes to friendship you can't have a worldly mindset when you're trying to do the Christian walk hello you, you can't because you will always in your flesh say oh well I'm always extending they ain't doing nothing for me. I, I'm always extending to those that I love. They ain't doing nothing for me. I'm always, I'm always putting my hand out. I'm always putting my prayers out. I'm always, I'm always, I'm putting on these ministry, uh, 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 Bible studies. Ain't nobody giving that to me. I could be like that. Listen, I could be like that. I could be like that right now. Nobody praying for me. Ain't nobody doing Bible study for me. Ain't nobody telling me to do this. I can say that. I can say all those things, right? But is that the Christian walk? No. The Christian walk is I pour, God fills. Same with you. You pour, God fills. And we pour into each other, and God fills us. Do you see the beauty in that? You think God is just going to leave you dry? I mean, there's some seasons where, yeah, he'll leave you dry to, to put you in a place of humility, to understand that, yes, I need you dry so that you know I'm the one that pours it. Like, I'm the one that fills your cup, right? And so it says in Psalms 23, God fills our cup. It, our cup overflows, right? So David and Jonathan are a perfect example of what it means to be consistent friends with a believer consistent friends we have to cherish our friendship guys we need to cherish oh man my brother tony's on here come on bro we're just about to talk about spiritual warfare in proverbs 27 17 i got another brother in here that i love with all my heart brother boyce moses is here i love this brother with all my heart my wife is here uh, my my wife my partner my sword sharpener my best friend these are people that I can count off my finger that will do these things for me. They will be a Jonathan for me. They will be praying for me, fasting for me, reading the word over my life, right? It's declaring life into my life when I'm struggling or whatever that is. Um, so we, we want to cherish. We want to value our friends that are there for us. The, the friends that are like, brother, I'll pray for you right now. What, what are you going through? I'll pray for you right now. I'm going to drop what I got. I'm going to put in my, I'm going to get in my prayer closet. I'm going to pray for you. A real brother, a real, a real Jonathan, a real David in your life. They're going to stop what they're doing. Look at Jonathan. Jonathan is the prince of Israel. Prince, okay? To his father. Second to his father. Prince. He dropped everything to make sure his friend David was okay. That's a friend. This is a man of royalty. This is a man of money, a man of wealth, a man of power, a man of uh, of renown. People know Jonathan. He know everyone knows who the prince is. Everybody knows my father is the king. You better be careful with me, because what I say, what I say, I tell my father, and he lets everybody be known, right? But Jonathan drops everything. He drops all that, all that. He throws it off the. He doesn't care about that. What he cares about is my friend David is in trouble, and I want to be there for him. That's the type of friend that I want. And I have, and I have those friends. I have, I have friends like that that they could be popular, and have all the all the success and all these things. But they drop all that to be like, hey, brother Justin, how are you doing? What is going on in your life? How can I pray for you today? I have, I have friends like that. I'm not boasting. I'm not bragging. I'm saying that God always put that person in your life, and you must cherish them, cherish your relationships. Please, I beg of you, do not let them go to waste. The, the, the saddest thing a Christian can do is to diminish the importance of good friendship. That's what I was saying in the other stream about marriage. Marriage should, marriage should be built on the premise of a great friendship. Because when your wife and you are not seeing eye to eye emotionally, as a friend, you'll still be there for them. As a friend, you'll still love them. You'll still sacrifice yourself for them because you're doing it what God wants. You're doing it how God sees it, right? A marriage should be built upon the premise of a kingdom friendship. Because when you have a relationship built up on a kingdom friendship, that foundation is firm in Jesus. That foundation is firm in God. That's why, uh, like I mentioned in my past stream, 
my wife is a ride or die. Okay, she 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 is she prays for me. She she reads the word over my kids. Okay, when when I'm down and out, she's she's right there for me, asking what's wrong. There to talk to me and me to her. Okay, and so it doesn't matter if like maybe one day or two we're not seeing eye to eye, or maybe we don't agree agree on something, but because our friendship is built first, because we we love each other as friends first, everything else is just a beautiful layer cake. Friendships, then my beloved wife, beloved partner, another layer cake, beloved uh, iron sword sharpener, beloved uh, uh, warrior in battle. Right? When we pray for our kids, when we pray over our kids, or something like that, right? That, that's the, that's the beautiful context of kingdom friendship. This is why I did this series is because I don't want you guys to miss who that person is. I want you to be praying for that person. If you don't have it yet, you don't have that person. If you're new to the faith and you don't have that brother or sister that's there for you, I promise you, if you pray for it, God will reveal that person to you. It's so it's so beautiful what happens when you just let God work. Don't 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 step on his toes. God is God knows what's going on. God knows exactly who he wants in your life. God knows exactly who he's going to put at the right time at the right moment. If I just want to share a quick story, um I remember there was a one point in my faith, right, where I was just on fire. I'm talking about on fire. I didn't know nobody. I just got kicked out of this group. I'm not going to say any names. I just got kicked out of this ministry and I was all alone and I was like, God, I don't know who you want me to be with. I don't know what ministry. I can't do ministry. I'm too young in my faith. I don't know who you want me to be with. And, and, and I have my brother Tony to, 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 to vouch on me on this story. So I'm, I'm on my end, I'm doing videos. I'm doing short little videos on Instagram, talking about the word of God, doing prayers, things like that. And then, and then on his end, um, his brother, who is his, my cousin, and we're all cousins. His brother is like, Hey man, you got to look at Justin's stuff. He, he, he's, he's doing stuff on Instagram. That's crazy. You got to look this up. He's doing, talking about God, talking about the scripture. He's on fire, man. You gotta, you gotta talk to him. So this brother who I, this is my beloved sword sharpener, he reaches me, and of course, we're family by blood, but then, you know, we are actually brothers in Christ, which is beautiful, and then he, he reaches out to me, he's like, hey man, you want to come to these prayer meetings, um, there's this guy named brother, you know, there's another brother, he, we go to his household, we're praying every Friday to do these prayer meetings, and, and you know, we just let the Spirit of God work, and I, if you're down, just, just let me know, just as the Spirit leads you, just as the Spirit leads you, he always tells me that, as the Spirit leads you, I'm like, at first, I'm like, I, I get what that means, but I, want, I, I never I never understood what prayer was until I went to this brother's house, until I went to pray with these brothers. I'm talking about bona fide warriors of the kingdom. Man, I walked into that house. I felt like I walked into a coliseum with armor on. I was like, what is this? I felt that peace in my spirit. This brother had the beautiful gift of hospitality. I walked in. He, looked, he talked to me like he knew me since I was a kid. Not the brother that I'm referring to, another brother, a uh, beloved brother. He led me into his household. I met him for the first time. He allowed me into his household. He offered me uh, as if I was been there, his, his, like I knew him my, my whole life. He, he offers me a, a seat on his couch and we put on some worship music and he's like, okay, we're going to start praying now. And I'm just there, just, you know, this is just my first time. I've never been at a prayer meeting before. I kind of get the gist of prayer. I love prayer, at, you know, at this point in my walk. And they started praying. I was like, what is this? And right away, right away, I was exposed to real spiritual warfare. I was exposed to real brothers. I was like, whoa, this is another level of spiritual warfare that I have never seen before in my life. And I was so young in my faith. And I was just like only a year and a half in or something like that. And I was, and then we would go every Friday, all that year. We were going every Friday, every Friday, every Friday, go and pray, go pray, go pray, go pray, go pray, go pray right? And uh, long story short, long story short is by by the grace of God, by his sovereignty and me just just acknowledging God, I just want to serve you. And my brother on the other end, just just praying to God, is this what you want for me to do as the spirit leads you? And, and then the beautiful culmination of what happens when you're led by the spirit who God invites into your life and who God removes out of your life. I'm going to say that one more time by the beautiful sovereignty of God. God removes people from your life and he puts in people in your life. OK. He does this for a good reason because sometimes those people are not good for your walk at that moment in time. Sometimes those people are not good for your walk. They might expose a, something in you that is flawed and you need someone else to sharpen you. And that's fine. That's okay. Let God do what he does best. And that is the perfect will of the Father. All we need to do is be obedient and lead and, and be guided by the Spirit as he leads, the Holy Spirit, right? Um, so that is what is happening between David and Jonathan. They are being led by God 
trusting in, in, in the Lord Yahweh, right? Jesus, obviously, um, before his uh, physical form upon the earth. They're trusting in God. They're trusting in the creator of the universe. They're trusting in the word of God. They're, they are brothers, uh, they're beloved brothers to one another. Their souls are engrafted in each other's hearts. They're willing to serve each other. They're willing to be selfless. They're willing to be consistent. They're willing to put their life on the, on the pause to address the brother in front of them. Okay? And and then now we're going to turn to Proverbs 27, 17. And we're going to break that down because this is going to be the end of this series. Okay? Before we start another live stream for something else that I want to talk about real quick. Okay, so we're going to go to Proverbs um, 2717. Okay, just going there in my ESV. Okay, all right, 2717. All right, we're going to read this again and we're going to break this down. Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Uh, in another verse is iron sharpens iron. So there's a uh, one man sharpen the countenance of his friend. Okay, there's multiple ways to see it, but this is how I'm going to break it down. Iron. Okay, sword sharpens sword. What happens when sword sharpens sword? There's fire sparks. When, oh, I'm about to get real deep. That verse means when iron brother sharpens iron, another brother, right? Sharpening what? The countenance, which means the essence of that person. They sharpen each other. What does that do? That means they take away the dullness. I'm about to get deep. This is one verse. They sharpen away the dullness. They sharpen away the laziness. They sharpen away the, the passivity in your life. They make you active. They make you sharp. They make you start fire. Have you seen when swords spark, when they, they clash? They cause fire. Who am I speaking to tonight? That when you have a brother and sister that you love and you sharpen, you know what you do? You spark revival. Oh, my! thank you, Jesus. That's what this verse is about. When you and another brother or you and another sister sharpen each other, you spark fire. You spark revival. You spark a fire that does not get quenched. You spark something that does not die out. And that is the powerful move of the Spirit. When one brother sharpens another, God says, when two or three gather in my name, I am in the midst. When one iron sharpens another iron, when one brother sharpens another brother, when there's moments of sharpening happening, like, brother, you got to stop sinning. Stop falling to pornography. We want to get we're gonna get serious. You want to get deep with me? Here we go. Stop looking at that woman. Stop looking at that man. You're married. Love your wife. Love your husband. Treat your kids right. Show them the love of God. Sharpen the blade of your children. Raise them up as disciples. Stop being fake with them. Stop just reading the Bible once in the blue. Sharpen your kids. Be intentional. That's that's tough love. Sharpening requires tough love. Sharpening requires painful reminders that we have to do this walk in hold the Holy Spirit's power. Because real love hurts sometimes. Real love hurts. It hurts because it causes you to sh get sharpened. You know when you sharpen a knife, you gotta you go there for a bit. You gotta sharpen the sides. You gotta get the other side. You gotta make sure it it cuts. And you know what's the crazy thing about when a sword is sharpened? It's ready for battle. Oh, Holy Spirit, speak through me tonight. Let someone be known. When you are sharpened by another brother and sister, your blade is being prepared for what? for battle why is god referring to men and women as iron because not only are you a weapon not you're a weapon that's not supposed to be messed with you're also a weapon of the most high god holy spirit speak for me tonight hallelujah when iron sharpens iron do you know what happens not only does it cause revival but it causes the weapons of god to be sharpened and ready for battle when my brother tony sharpens me what does that do to me? It makes me want to fight the enemy a hundred times more than I ever did. Why? Because it puts a fire in my heart, in my spirit. It tells me that, Justin, I need to go to war. A real brother and sister. This Proverbs 27, 17 is so deep. It's so profound. This is the word of God. I'm not talking off the top of my lips. The word of God is so profound because what does it do? It sharpens you. This sword it's a physical and it's a spiritual sword. God says, engraft the words of God upon your heart. Write it upon my heart, God. You need to know scripture. You need to have ammunition in your spiritual gun. So when the word of God is not in front of you, the physical word, like our brothers and sisters in China, they don't have means to a real Bible anymore. They got taken that taken away. So they have to live by what? By the word of God engrafted upon their heart. So what do they do? They sharpen one another. 
They pray for one another. As I pray for you, you pray for me. I speak the word over your life. You speak the word over my life. Why? Because it sharpens our blades for battle. And it starts a fire that the enemy cannot quench. When the enemy sees two Christians or three Christians and four Christians, it, imagine how many times in scripture have we seen uh, 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 duos working together. Elijah and Elisha. Paul and Silas in the prison. Peter and, 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 and John and James and Jesus, when they were all tag team with one another, John and Andrew and Simon Peter, when they were all tag teaming with one another, Moses and Joshua, Joshua and Caleb, when they were partnering up, they did more damage because they were what? They were working together. God is the beauty. He, this, this whole iron sharpens iron, it's so beautiful because it shows how God's nature is triune in his nature because he shows us how to have relationship with one another because he has relationship with himself he is a triune God the Holy Spirit the Father and the Son they are having a constant perfect relationship that is eternal between the midst of them one God that is triune in his nature and that and, and, and it's crazy because we are an image bearer of God. So what does that mean? That means we are representations of the triune being. What does that mean? That we are not supposed to do this alone. Boom. We are not supposed to do this alone. We are not supposed to walk this alone. We're not to be called lone wolves. We're not supposed to be called uh, 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 solo uh, uh, soldiers. We're supposed to do this together. The body of Christ works more efficiently when the body of Christ works together and listens to the will of the Father. This is the beautiful, beautiful context of this verse. This verse sets the foundation of what it means to be effective in battle. I need my brothers and sisters praying for me. I need my wife praying for me because what it does do, it sharpens me for battle. It prepares my tongue for warfare against the enemy. Now, we're going to about to do that in the next live stream because we're about to finish up here. But this beautiful series, mini series, very short, just three parts. I, 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 I recommend you watch the other two parts because they were super powerful. Uh, not by my grace, by the grace of God. Um, but to conclude this series, I want to leave you with these words. And, and, this, and these words of encouragement before we jump into the next uh, little mini live stream that I got planned. Um, value the ones that caused your fire in your heart to blow up. Value the friends and the family and the brothers and sisters that are in your life that you know by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, that they are constantly, constantly praying for you. Value those friendships. Treasure those friendships. Thank God for those friendships. And do the same for them. And you know what's crazy? And this is how we show the world that we are Jesus' disciples. Jesus says, by the way you love one another, the world will know you are my disciples. Come on, man. It doesn't get more profound than that. It doesn't get more, more beautiful than that, that we wrap this up in gospel. We have to bring it back to the word of God. We have to bring it back to what Jesus said. Jesus says, the world, not Christians, lost souls will know that we are Jesus' disciples by the way we love each other. Isn't that amazing, guys? When I sharpen you, you sharpen me. We're showing the world. I want a piece of that. I, I want what they have. I want what those two brothers have. I want what those two sisters have. When they come together, they look like they're having the best time of their life. Why? Because they love each other as God loves each as God loves them. God is filling them as they fill each other. Isn't that beautiful? God fills when you pour into each other. When I when I pour into my wife, my wife pours into me, God fills us. Don't worry about, oh, I'm vulnerable and, oh, they're going to, they know my inner secrets and, oh, I should have never told that person that. Trust me, you will know who your real friends are. They're never going to, they're never going to shoot you down like that because we're soaring like eagles. We got to walk in that power. We got to walk in that authority. We got to walk like we know what we're talking about because when we don't do those things, and this is, this is what I'm going to leave it on. When we don't sharpen each other, when we leave our blades dull. When we don't uh, cherish our friendships, we don't cherish our relationships, we're doing this solo, we're a sheep lost without a shepherd. And we're going to go right off a cliff, leading everyone else astray. We're going to teach false doctrine. We're going to teach the false word of God. 
We're going to feed the enemy what he wants by not doing the will of the Father, by not sharpening one another, by not listening to what God is telling us to do every single day, right? That, that should convict you on the spot. If you're not doing those things, if you're not praying for your beloved brothers and sisters, if you're not praying for those friendships that God has given you in your life, if you're not doing those things, I, I rebuke you. I rebuke you on the spot. As a loving brother, I rebuke you. You should not be living of the flesh. You should be living of the Spirit of God who dwells within your temple. And if you're living like the world thinks and how the world acts and you got to say, oh, it's all about me, me, me. I got to watch out for myself. I can't let nobody in. Nobody in my house. Nobody in my in my secrets. Nobody in my life. Everybody don't got to know about what I'm doing. It's just between me and God. A to B. A to B is uh, unfortunate. But someone that I love greatly, not going to just shoot them down, but someone I love greatly says, oh, it's just me and God. A to B. A to B. It's just me and God. Me and God. I don't need to worry about you. It's just A to B. I don't need a church. I don't need to be in fellowship. It's just A to B. A to B. A to B. What is that? What is A to B? Of, of course, you must have a relationship with the Father. Absolutely. You, your, your whole foundation of your faith must be built on the premise of your relationship with the Father in heaven. Absolutely. But then what's the second commandment that God calls us to do? You shall love one another as you love yourself. The first commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second commandment is just as important as the first. You must love your neighbors as you love yourself. You must love your brothers and sisters as you love yourself. You must love your family as you love yourself. You must love the lost as you love yourself. And how can you love others if you can't love yourself? How can you love others if you're just selfish about what you care about or what you think? I rebuke you if that's not how you're living. I rebuke you if that's not if that's not your attitude and your walk. And you say, well, I don't need nobody. I don't. They messed up. They messed up with me. They lost their chance. I rebuke you. You need to be humble. You need to repent. And get on your knees and say, God, forgive me of my selfishness. And don't, 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 and don't think I don't do that. <laughs> Please. I, 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 God puts me in my place. When I mess up, God puts me in my place. He makes sure I don't come up on here as false witness. We have to walk as God calls us. We have to walk as God calls us. We must deny our flesh, pick up the cross, and follow him. Jesus set the example. He set the bar of every single Christian life. We must be imitators of God. We are image bearers to him. How in the world is a person that does not have any of this, no scripture, right? The lost, no scripture. They think this is just a book. They think this is just a book. Just any other book. The lost could care less about this. How in the world are we going to show them the Bible if the Bible is not written upon you? That's something, another thing that Brother Tony told me. Sometimes people don't even get to this yet. They read you first. Got to go, bud. Love you, bud. God bless. God bless you, Brother Boyce Moses, man. Like I mentioned before in the comments, we definitely need to do a live stream together, man. I, I, would, I would love to set that up to have you on board and we just do some Q&A uh, with, the, with, the, with the chat. Um, yeah, but you have to remember is that sometimes people don't get to this first. They don't get to the scripture yet because they're not even saved yet. Why, why are they going to even bother the time in the word? They don't even know what this means. What, what is iron sharpens iron? Is that like a sword? Is that like a knife? Like they're not going to know the context of this. They don't have no Holy Spirit inside of them. The first Bible they're going to read is you and your testimony and what you have been doing and what fruits God is producing in you. They're going to look at your life and they say, what's so good about Christianity? I don't see no fruit in you. You're always miserable. You're always sad and depressed that you sound like me. Well, 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 what's the difference between you and I? I'm sorry, but it's the truth. It hurts. It's the truth. How are we supposed to show the loss that we are in the right side? If we act and mimic the world. Oh, man, I'm depressed. Oh, me too. <laughs> oh, man, I'm running out of luck. Me too. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you're talking like the world? Why are you talking like them? You have God's word upon your heart? Why are you talking like them? Why are you acting like them? We're supposed to let them uh, want to be a part of the church. We, want, we, they, we, we need to make them jealous of what we got, which is a relationship with the Father, which they can have. Not be jealous of what they got. What does the world offer? Nothing. The world offers us a lost soul, depressed and lost out of your mind. Jesus offers life and life eternally. Amen? So this concludes this Bible study. This concludes this series. I pray it was edifying. I pray it was encouraging. Um, the next live stream that we're going to do right now is going to be talking about spiritual warfare. And we're going to do a little prayer. 
and then we're going to close out the night. All right. So if you want to stick around, join me in the next live stream. We're going to be talking about spiritual warfare, uh, talking a little more about Proverbs 27, 17, and a little more about deliverance and things where it's going to go down for this ministry. Amen. Love you guys. God bless. Take care.